is a very important subject. It's a subject which us as ethnic minorities living in this country must understand and we must fulfill as Muslims, first and foremost, then as ethnic minorities in this country. Allah Jalla Ala said in the Quran, in wa illa dhikrun lil alameen. That indeed this is a dhikr, a reminder for the whole world and for those who desire the straight path. This ayah clearly shows the role of a Muslim wherever he is. The role of a Muslim wherever he is is number one, to worship Allah in Muhammad. But I have not created the jinn or the mankind except to worship me. And then after that, he has to give dawah to this. So our role here in the West is basically dawah, calling to Allah Jalla after we have worked, we've learned to worship Allah correctly. This dawah cannot be done anyhow and however you want it to happen. This dawah has some basis, and the basis is ilm, knowledge. That's the first basis. Then the second basis, after ilm, is action. We act upon the knowledge that we attain. <coughs> then the third aspect of this da'wah, the third foundation of this da'wah, is actually giving physically the da'wah. And that's what we're going to discuss today, the two types of da'wah. And then fourthly, it doesn't stop there. Fourthly, we have to have patience and perseverance in giving da'wah and patience and perseverance against the enmity that will come to us for attaining the knowledge, for acting upon the knowledge and for giving the da'wah. Because you will have harm come to you from your close ones and your far ones, relatives, friends, neighbors, your community. When you seek knowledge, you will find obstacles from amongst them. When you act upon the knowledge, you'll find obstacles in your, from your family and from your relatives, from the wider community, from all the non-Muslims, from everybody. And when you give down to it, that is when you will have, or you will, you will experience the most enmity. So you require patience, perseverance, and suffer in all three. So the ayah I read right at the beginning, but verily this is a reminder for the whole of humanity. And dhikra in this ayah means the Qur'an and the Sunnah. It means the Sharia. The legislation that Allah Jalla wa has legislated for mankind to follow for their own benefit. That in here, illa dhikra lil dhikrun lil alameen. That indeed it is a reminder, a legislation for the whole of the world. So the question comes now <coughs> is what is our role vis a vis this dawah to Allah Jalla wa ala? There is another ayah in the Quran. But before I read this ayah in the Quran, it's imperative to understand that people's lives in this world are filled with choices. People here in the West, their lives are full of choices. To choose good, to choose bad. They can choose to drink alcohol or drink milk. They can choose to take drugs or be on the right path. They can choose music, they can choose reading Quran. People's lives are made up of choices of whether to follow a religion or not to follow a religion. Whether to be Muslim, Christian, Jew, whatever it may be. But Allah Jalla wa ala, He sends reminders to His creation time and time again, to remind them of him, to remind them that his religion, he is to be worshipped and his religion is to be followed, and to remind them that what he has laid down of legislation is best for mankind. He sends these reminders time and time again. Some of us may have experienced some of these reminders in the form of trials, tribulations, difficulties, hardships. All these are reminders in here, in that dhikrun lil alameen. They are not except a reminder for the whole world to return back to Allah, follow His Sharia, follow His Quran and the Sunnah. So then, the ayah which I wanted to read out was the one where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He said about the Muslims, their role. He said, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَ لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا. Which means that, and as such, we have made you. The balanced nation. Why? لِتَكُولُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ Such that you may be witnesses over the people. So Allah is saying here, 
that we've made you a balanced nation, meaning giving you the balanced way, giving you the balanced legislation, legislation, the Quran and the Sunnah, which is balanced. No extreme and no belittling, no neglect. It's balanced, it's right in the middle. We've given this to you. We've made you as such. What for? It's a kunu shuhada al nas. So I said, you may be witnesses against the people. The question is, are we fulfilling this ayat? First and foremost, are we upon that balanced way of the understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah? Second thing is, if we are, are we doing what Allah has ordered us to do? Be witnesses against mankind, meaning going to them and giving them down. Now, how do we be witnesses to mankind? There are two ways. I'll come back to this ayah and I'll explain that as we go along, inshallah. We'll stop here and, and look now at the hadith of the Prophet where he said, Balli <laughs> Relate from me even if it is just one verse. So we know now what we have to transmit, what we have to give as witness over mankind. So relate from me even if it is one ayah. He said, learn the required principles of Islam and the Quran and teach them to others. For I do not know how long I will be amongst you. Hadith in San Bukhari. So here, Allah is telling us that we have to be witnesses over mankind. The Messenger is telling us, relate from me even if it's one verse. So clearly we can see that this is the role of a Muslim. After worshipping Allah, having patience in seeking knowledge, after having patience in acting upon knowledge, and continue being continuous in that, and after being patient in giving da'wah, and all the elements that comes with that, after all this, he must continue to convey this message even if it's one, one ayah. He must continue to remain on that moderate, that middle path which Allah has placed him upon. Today, man, many, most of us Muslims are too busy, concerned about how much money we're going to learn at the end of the month, whether we can pay this haram mortgage or not. We're too concerned about the wealth, we're too concerned about our status, our position, getting married, you know, um, buying houses, you know, we're, we're, we're concerned about the rights that people have over, over that, that, that we have over people. My parents are not giving me my rights, my children are not giving me my rights, you know, my friends, my neighbors are not giving me my rights, you know, rights, rights, and we don't give them their rights. All, everybody's concerned about each other's rights, but when it comes to Allah's rights, we leave that under the carpet, under the table, we're not concerned about that so much. Ma'ad ibn Jabal, he said, the Prophet he said to Mu'ad ibn Jawad, Do you know what Allah's right is upon his servants? And he said, Allah and his messenger know best. So he said, Allah's right is that the people worship him in oneness and do not associate any partners with him. And he said, do you know what the right of the people are over Allah? He said, Allah is messenger no best. He said that Allah does not throw them in the hellfire if they single him out for worship alone. So this is the right of Allah, worshiping him in oneness, not associating any partners with him in the slightest. This is also found in the ayah of Quran. In Allah la yashā. That verily Allah does not forgive those who make shirk associate partners with him. But he forgives any other sin other than that for whomever he wants. So this issue of shirk and associated partners with Allah is the very first thing that we have to warn <coughs> mankind against. So the opposite of that is calling to Tawheed. That is the first role of a Muslim. That he calls to Allah Jalla wa'ala, he calls to Tawheed. Secondly, he must remain steadfast upon this Tawheed. Uh, upon this tawheed. As we mentioned right at the beginning of the lecture, when you call to Tawheed, it has to be upon knowledge. And when you call to it upon knowledge, then it will be, it will, it will supersede and it will overwhelm every other religion if you call to Tawheed correctly upon knowledge. We know this from where? We know this from the ayah of the Quran, where Allah said, Who Stop there. He is the one who sent 
his messenger bil huda with the guidance his guidance is what the quran and his sunnah this is this is the makeup of knowledge he is the one who sent his messenger with knowledge what for bil haq liyudhhiruhu ala deen kullihi the ayah said again in order to make this religion islam overwhelm all the other religions overtake over supersede all the other religions so this will not happen unless it's upon guidance upon ilm upon knowledge we place the word huda with knowledge and there you have it so therefore this tawhid if it is based upon knowledge and is giving dawa it will overwhelm so this is why you find many people in the west here embracing islam because they've been given the correct knowledge of tawhid and this is why you see many of them coming to the dawa as salafiya and ahl hadith because these are the carriers of the correct knowledge of tawhid how many non muslims do you see embrace sufiya how many non muslims do you see embrace shiaism how many non muslims do you see embrace qadiyaniya or any other fiqh that you see you, they do embrace i'm not saying they don't but in very low numbers in comparison to how when they embrace they embrace amongst the salafis and amongst the ahl hadith this is what we've witnessed over the last 20 years here in the UK. Because why? The Tao is based upon ilm, based upon knowledge. So those of us who have um, perhaps uh, some, 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 some shortfall in our knowledge of Tawheed, we must attain this. So we call to Tawheed, we, 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 we worship Allah in oneness, we call to Tawheed, and we strive upon this, and we abstain from all Allah Jalla wa uh, prohibitions. And we conduct as much of the commandments that he's ordered us, ordered us to do. And then finally, we are also required to strive against our own souls, our nafs. Because we can attain that knowledge of Tawheed. And we can act upon this knowledge of Tawheed. And we can give dawah to that knowledge of Tawheed. And we can be patient with the harsh hardship and difficulties that comes from this but if we don't purify our own nafs our own selves the effectiveness of all that that formula the effectiveness effectiveness of that formula will be weak imagine the tasqeel of your nafs as a, a, a gauge the more we make tasqeel of our nafs the more effective our seeking knowledge giving dawah and being patient will be and acting upon knowledge will be. The less we are making that tazkiyah of our nafs, our soul, then we'll be on the other side of the gauge, where our seeking knowledge will be weak. Our acting upon knowledge will be weak. Our giving dawah will be weak. And our patience will be weak. So the tazkiyah of the nafs comes hand in hand with this calling of tawheed and giving dawah. As Allah Jalla Ali said, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيدًا then those who strive in our cause, then we shall certainly guide them to our path. Because indeed Allah is with those who do good. We need Allah with us and we need to be on His path to make our da'wah, our call to Tawhi, effective. So this is the role of Muslims in Islam, seeking knowledge acting upon the knowledge, giving dawah to that knowledge, and making patience in all these three areas, and in addition to that, making patience when the harm comes to us, and the difficulty comes to us, and we are, you know, given some harm, harsh words or you know, physical, you know, uh, hardship from those who do not wish to hear Allah's message be spread. But how do we give this knowledge now? And <coughs> what I said, Invite all to the way of your Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them in the most best ways. So this is how we give the da'wah when we come to that stage of giving da'wah. We give it with wisdom and beautiful preaching. As Allah Jalla wa explained about the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لو كنت فد غليد القلب لم فد من حولك فاعف عنهم واستغفر لهم وشاورهم في العمر. that if you were harsh hearted with
killed them. They would have fled from around you. So pardon them and ask Allah to forgive them and consult them in their affairs. This is a description of a believer. One who wants to give da'wah with wisdom and good preaching. As Allah told us in the ayah before, we should have gentleness. But does that mean gentleness all the time? He's saying, we know the hadith of the Prophet where he said, that verily Allah gives through gentleness that which he does not give through harshness. But then we see from the hadith of the Prophet how he was harsh with Mu'adhi bin Jabal. Afatan anti ya Rasulullah. Ah, if I stop moving. Afatan anti ya Mu'ad, he said. Rasulullah said to Mu'ad, in the Jabal. And we saw how he treated Khalid bin Walid after Khalid bin Walid killed a man who said, La ilaha illa Rasulullah. He said, Akatalta nafsan ba'da ma qala la ilaha illa Allah. He raised his hand and said, Oh Allah, I am free from what Khalid has done. So this is how he admonished them with harshness. We know from Musa and Harun. When Musa came down from the mountain, he saw Harun and he saw the idol they created. He took him by his hair and his beard and he pulled him towards him. Is this not harshness? There are many <coughs> cases where harshness is actually legislated in the religion of Islam. But the overriding way in which we give da'wah is gentleness. And we only use the harshness in this right place when it's necessary. But gentleness, it must be used uh, in the first instance and takes priority over the harshness. And also, harshness should only be used in your dawah if you know you're going to achieve the objective. Because if you look at the objective and say, right, this is my objective. Now, if I be harsh to him, I know it's going to be worse. Then you don't use harshness. It's better to remain silent. If you can't use gentleness, just remain silent and don't do nothing. If it's going to lead to something which is worse. When Allah Jalla Wa said, then call to the way of your Lord with hikmah and wisdom. Um, of course, knowledge, you really need knowledge, and knowledge takes preparation. It needs some people to take time out from their busy lives and go and study. And then come back and give it down and have the knowledge. But not every Muslim has the ability to give that time. So does that mean now that the dawah falls off the shoulders of the rest of those who don't have the ability to give their time to study? Does it? Obviously not. Because of the ayah of the Quran. ummatan wasata. He made you a bad station. So you may be a witness over the mankind. So whether you have taken that time out to study and give da then give dawah or not, you still have to give dawah. But the people are of two types. The people are of those who have taken their time out to study. Sat with the Mashiach, the scholars and learned and memorized Quran and the Hadith and they studied books with them and they come back and they teach the general people and they go and give dawah by writing articles by debating and dialoguing, or perhaps they do talks, etc., or lectures, and where thousands of people exist, and, uh, gather, and so on and so forth. These people are specialists. Those are the people who are, have a special field. But as for the rest of us, how do we give down? We give down, my brothers, through our actions. Yes, a Muslim gives down through his actions. When he wakes up in the morning, till he goes to sleep at night, he is giving down. You will come and meet other Muslims for the course of the, course of the day, yes or no? Even if it's your family or, or your neighbors or your friends, you'll meet them. The way you behave with them, the way you speak with them, the way you deal with them is the Tao. So if you rip off your Muslim brother in a business transaction, that's the Tao you've given him. That's what he's going to think about Islam. So if you see your Muslim brother and you backbite and slander him and he finds out, oh, so you backbite me, you slandered me, you said these bad things about me, that's the Tao you've given him. Consider it done. That is you implementing the Takunu Shuhada Al Nasi. I've made you a ballastation so you so that you will be a witness against uh, over the people. And the same with the non-Muslims as well. If you meet the non-Muslims and you look at them and say, dirty kufar, you look at them like this. This is the Dao which you've given them. Or if you go to a non-Muslim and you you know you steal from him, or you do a business transaction. And you want to cheat him, thinking he's just a non-Muslim, so he doesn't mean he's got no rights. Alhamdulillah, he has rights as a non-Muslim. And so you do him over, and he finds out later, these are Muslims, with beards, and they're jealous out of business transactions. 
They cheated and they lied. What kind of religion is this that I'm going to follow? So we are all giving down from our actions from morning till night. When you go to your workplace in the, in the borough councils or with the non-Muslims, you see a female there. You shake a hand. We don't shake a hand. It's haram. And when you don't shake a hand, you explain to her why. And she will understand. We've done this many times. It's not the most pleasant thing, but we do it many times and we explain to them. And it's not out of disrespect for you. It's out of respect. And the only person that can touch you is your husband. You know, how would your husband feel for another man touching you? And so on and so forth. We have other ways to explain to them. But my point is, that is Tao, when you meet this non-Muslim. What about now, when you, um, when you deal with your authorities? The authorities come knock on the door. Say, you witnessed a burglary next door. You witnessed um, a, car, a hit and run outside your house. And I see you have a CCTV camera, and it's pointing at the, at the point of, or the place where the accident or the, the incident took place. We need to have this copies of, your, of, of the CCTV camera. What do you do? You know that that incident took place. It was your cousin and not the hit and run. Mm. You gonna go and take that CCTV camera and give it to him or not? He's a Muslim brother who done the hit and run. Are you gonna take it or not? Yes. Of course you have to. You take it and you give it. This is Dawah in Allah. Because if you didn't and they found out you didn't do it, first number one, you'd be sinful inside of Allah. Secondly, is when they find out you've done this because he was your cousin, or you've done this because he was a Muslim, or your friend, this is the da'wah you're giving to the people. This is how you are implementing al shuhada al nasi shahida. Now let's move on to da'wah. There are um, a number of calls in this day and age in the West here to Islam. People are telling us that the Muslim will struggle. The Muslim Ummah is in a terrible state. We agree that we should call him to Tawheed. But this is from Tawheed. In al hukum illa lillah. That there is no hukum, all legislation and, and, and uh, all legislation belongs to Allah. That the hukum is for Allah alone. So you don't say this. These are people from, who have a political movement and a political manhaj. And they want to give da'wah here in the West <coughs> using politics, we say to them, in the time of the Prophet وسلم, he had the opportunity to go into politics, but he didn't do it. They said, we'll make you our king, we'll give you the finest woman, whatever you say we'll do. So he had an opportunity to take the leadership, get into politics. He said, if you put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, I still won't give up my call. Meaning I'll continue to call to Tawheed. But what was the reason why the Mushrikeen in the time of the Prophet وسلم, offered him this and fought him for calling to Tawheed, killed many of his companions, harmed him, they gave so much enmity towards him, drove him out of <coughs> Mecca. Why? What was the main reason? Can anybody tell me? Money. It wasn't because they disbelieved in his message entirely. You know, they knew that, well, Muhammad is a righteous man, lived with us for many years. Him being a prophet is not something strange. But they couldn't accept it. Why? Because of the, of, of the economical downfall that would, be, that would occur in Mecca. People would come to Mecca from all, four, all four corners of the earth for the, for the pilgrimage. There was a money-making machine, a money-making center. And those chieftains of Mecca were rich. They had everything. They didn't want to lose their money. So, it's all, so, it's all, so you can, can you see how, if the Prophet wanted, he could turn to the Sahaba and say, right, let's make another Kaaba somewhere. Drive all the people over to our Kaaba, and we'll compete with them financially in, in making an economical crisis in their own uh, Mecca. But the Prophet didn't do that. The Prophet, he could have even said to them, the Mushrikeen, the chieftains, you are only doing this because you fear loss of your wealth. Do you have, can anybody show me a hadith, a narration, where the Prophet said that? He never said that. He just continued on telling them that this worship of false gods is haram. It's impermissible. You're taking Allah's right away. Do not worship these, these idols, these statues, he continued to call to Tawheed. 
So therefore, these people who are called to politics, who push us to go into politics, go into politics here in the West, this is the role of a Muslim, to get into politics, become an MP, mayor, lord, and then get into the seat of the hukum where you can become the president. All the Muslims will vote for you, and they will change the country. This is Baqir. If there was any good in this, the Prophet Sallallahu he would have done this a lot. He would have done this in his time, during his time. We know the Prophet have said that the Khilafah will return. And when he returns, it will return upon my Sunnah. Today, we have Muslims worshipping other men, humans. Making sajda to the feet of fear, a saint, Qutub. We have people, Muslims, um, going to soothsayers, magicians, and they're asking, and they're worshipping, some of them are worshipping jinn. We have non Muslims here in the West worshipping Jesus, son of Mary. We have those worshipping Mary. We have those worshipping three. You know, we have, you know, Hindus worshipping idols, statues, wood, anything that moves. They create a god with their own hands and then they go and sell him in the shop and they worship him. <coughs> this is the state of the Hindus and the Buddhists. And then we have those who worship most filthy of things on this earth. So, they want us to leave all this, you know, refuting all this. Leave refuting all this. And just concentrate on getting into politics and then bringing the Tao of Islam that way? No. This is not for my Islam. Abdul ibn Umar, he said that the Prophet Sallallahu said that you will be afflicted with five things and may Allah forbid that you live to see them. <laughs> Prophet Sallallahu said to his companions and he's looking into the future. Why future? Because he said may Allah forbid you live to see them. You'll be afflicted with five things. May Allah forbid that you live to see them. I will mention one of them. And that is, when the people leave their covenant to Allah, and they leave their covenant to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What does that mean? That means shirk. When the people begin to associate shirk with Allah, and abandon following the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you should know for sure, he says, that this never happens without Allah sending some of their enemies against them to take their possessions. Exactly, an exact description of what is happening in this world today. Our enemies have taken over our lands to take our possessions. They've taken our oil in Iraq, in Libya, they're, taking, they're controlling the oil in Qatar, in Saudi Arabia, in Emirates, taking our possessions, taking whatever they want from the Muslim lands. And Allah's message doesn't speak of his own desires. He speaks revelation has been revealed to him. He's told us why Allah allowed this to happen. He said, because when the people leave their covenant to Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu then you should know this never happens without Allah sending some of their own enemies, their own enemies, against them to take on their positions. So we must look into the covenant that we claim to be following Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan rasulullah which is the essence of tawheed which brings you back to the beginning of the speech which I mentioned this is what is upon us as our, our role in this as muslims here in the west seek knowledge and the knowledge of tawheed is at the head of all this number 2 act upon that knowledge number 3 give dawah to that knowledge and being patient con and continuous in all three and then fourthly being patient with the harm and the difficulties and hardships that come to us as a result of doing those three actions I mentioned earlier. Then, inshallah, we will be given Allah's rights. If you give Allah his rights, then Allah will give you your rights. وَكَانَ وَعَدٌ عَلَيْنَا نَصْرٌ مُؤْمِنِينَ That it is a promise binding upon us, Allah said, that we will aid and help the believers. The believers, mu'mineen, not the muslimin. Not the ones who say La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. But those who believe, who say La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah Rasulullah, and believe in La ilaha illallah Rasulullah. Those who act upon it and call to it. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about that is conducive or perfect for this society, the West. 
Many people think otherwise. They think no, Islam is at loggerheads with the, with the West, with the Christianity and Judaism. They cannot live side by side. Islam is a religion which is alien to the thinking of the West. But they're quite wrong in that. Because Islam, if you look at the history, it lived side by side with the Jews and the Christians for many centuries. It started in the time of the Prophet When the Prophet went to Medina, he lived with who? The Jews and the Christians. He made contracts with the Jews and the Christians. He had business with the Jews and the Christians. He visited them and they visited him. He ate from their food and they ate from his food. They married their women, women and they married the Muslim married the women of the Ahl Kitab and so on and so forth. So much that even Allah said in the Quran that this day I have, like this day I have made their food halal for you and your food halal for them and their women halal for you. But today we see the thing, no, this is impossible. We cannot be living side by side with the non-Muslims. This was the way of the Prophet The Prophet had very close, you know, um, good relations with the Jews and the Christians in the time of, in his time. We know there was a Jewish woman who gave the Prophet a piece of meat to eat as a gift. A dish. You remember this sort of story? Yeah. She poisoned it. And she gave it to him. My question is, if it was not the habit of the Prophet ﷺ to take gifts of such nature, he wouldn't have taken that. But it was his nature to take gifts from the non-Muslims. And give gifts. So you can see how the how they lived there side by side. So much she poisoned it. And they said that this was probably one of the causes of his death towards the end of his life. But that's what we start from there. Another hadith of the boy, the Jewish boy, who was on his deathbed dying and the Prophet went to visit him. He looked and his father was sitting next to him. He looked and said, look, this is the Amir, the leader of the Muslims that's come to visit me. He was shocked, the boy was. He's ill on his deathbed dying. And he said, the president, it's like the president coming to visit one of you guys in your home. Yeah, it's like that. It's like maybe the queen coming to visit one of you in your own home. That's what a big thing it was when the person went to a Jewish boy. It wasn't even a Muslim, it was a Jew, just to visit him when he was sick. So here you can see, they used to visit each other. Not only, not only so much, if you read that story carefully, you'll find that they actually <laughs> loved him. And Jews, Christians loved him, but they hid it. Why? Because when he said to the boy, Oh boy, say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. The boy, what did he do? He looked upon his father. What did his father say? He al Qasim. He said, Obey Abu Qasim. He called Muhammad sallallahu by his kunya. And it's well known amongst the Arabs that they do not use kunya except with the people they love. So this was the state of the Jews in the time of the Prophet. <coughs> and the Prophet's son, he obviously the boy to the Shahada and he went out happy saying, Allah saved this boy from the hellfire uh, through me, alhamdulillah. Another example. When the Prophet was called to a meeting, when there were two Jewish tribes arguing with each other, arguing on the verge of waging war against each other, they called the Prophet Sallallahu to come and make sulh between them. Did he say, ah, you Jews go away, you sort your own problems out? No. He went there to help them with a good intention. And when he got there, they plotted to kill him. He sat in a place where a huge rock was supposed to be thrown. But obviously, Jibreel al-Islam informed him. You know, and he, got, he didn't get harmed by this. Did the Prophet Sallallahu gather those whole two Jewish tribes and chop off their heads? Did he punish all of them indiscriminately? Like the non-Muslim would have done if we did that to one of their presidents. And we wouldn't do that anyway, because that's treacherous. And Muslims are not people of treachery. It shows you what? It shows you 
the person held the, the ones responsible only and punished them. It shows you how the person used to interact with fairness and justice with them, and how they didn't love him really, and it shows how the interaction was between the Muslims and the non-Muslims. And f finally, and we'll end on this point, uh, these are all little tips of how we have to be good Muslims and, and show a good character and good behavior with the non-Muslims and the Muslims living here in the West. Is that a believer, a Muslim, is one who does not break, break his oaths and his contracts. That the believers are upon their contracts. They are upon their agreements that they make. So if you make an agreement, you must strive to fulfill that agreement. We cannot break this agreement. We cannot think of it as trivial. Just because it's done with a Muslim or a non-Muslim, or somebody less than me, and I'm more, or, and I'm more powerful than them, I, I'm going to disregard it. But this is one of the characteristics which is most hated by the non-Muslims, especially in the West. What they can't stand is people breaking their contracts and oaths, people who take their rights. So we should concentrate on that, brothers. And inshallah ta'ala, we ask Allah Jalla to give us the tawfiq, to be good Muslims in this, uh, in this country here in the West, give a good example, and be witnesses unto mankind as Allah has described us, um, all of us, and may he make some of us also from those category of people who will take time out and study the knowledge and come back, educate the others and give da'a in, uh, in, by writing articles in a big way, writing books <coughs> to the non-Muslims. I fully go ahead and ask that for me when from Muslim. If there's any questions or so, please you can ask. Yeah, he just sorry. He said uh, Muslims don't say shahada. Did he say that? Did I say Muslims don't say shahada? He just said something about uh, the Mu'minin. Ah, Mu'minin and Muslim. Yeah. Yeah, there's a difference between Muslim and Mu'minin. As Allah said, Surah Hujarat, if someone goes to Surah Hujarat, open, open it, it's only a small surah. They say, it says in there in the meaning, Allah SWT said, the, the desert Arabs say that they believe, that they're moving, Amanna. Tell them they do not believe. They have only submitted, meaning they've only made Islam and not Iman. So there's a distinction between Islam first and then Iman. Also in the hadith of Jibreel al Islam, in Bukhari, where he came and he said to the Prophet, inform me about Islam. So he said, Islam is the five pillars. Then he said, inform me about Iman. And he mentioned Iman, the six pillars of Iman. So you can see from there is a differentiation between the two. So Iman is when you act upon these five pillars of Islam and you believe, truly believe in your heart that you will be, number one, held accountable by Allah Jalla wa Ala because uh, you, are, you will be held accountable by Allah if you do not fulfill this action. And you have this love of Allah, you hope in Him, and you fear Him. What is the essence from illa wa antum muslimun? That is the least. You don't die except as in the state of Islam. But what we do, we ask Allah to make us die as believers. We have to at least, at least, die as Muslims. Why? Because if you're a Muslim, you've submitted. you said the Shahada. And the Prophet said, whoever says the Shahada, yeah, what do you want to do in Jannah? Jannah is an obligatory for him. We know that for Hadith, he said to Ibn Abbas, You said there were five things that our Prophet... I didn't write the other form, sorry, I know you asked me. I was coming in, and I only quickly wrote the one I remember. All right, sure. I was asking when he said that. So people understand this wrong as they think that Madderos was halal. I don't know that subject here. My devil is halal or haram. <laughs> I've read the eye in the Quran. Seek your knowledgeable people in this masjid to give you tafsir. Okay? This day I bring halal for you, the food of the people of the book for you, and your food for them. So you go now, ask the people of the masjid to explain that, okay? Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Well, do this one and then go to the back. One second, this one here first. Yeah, I'll let this one ask first, yeah? You mentioned that a lot of non-Muslims are, um, are, are converting to the yeah. Salafi or Ahl Hadith. Mm -hmm. uh, but should we be calling ourselves Salafis or Shafis or Hanafis? I mean, mm -hmm. doesn't that go against what Desimu be Jami and Walat Afurika? Yeah, beautiful, beautiful question. The question is basically, um, 
you know, I mentioned that many of the Muslims are embracing this Salafi Arabic way of Al Islam uh, way. And the brother said, but should we not be called, should we really be calling ourselves Salafi Ahadi, Hanafi Maliki, Hanbali, you know, when Allah said, do not uh, divide and split into sects and groups. As you know, this is a, a very uh, famous ayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Do not be like the mushrikeen, those who divide their religion into sects and parties. Another ayah said, um, uh, hold fast all of you to the rope of Allah and do not be divided. So, you know, do we need to have these um, these names, names, etc. or not? As for naming oneself Maliki, Hanbali, Shafi, and uh, Hanafi, naming yourself after a madhab, then I say, you're right, you're correct. We should not use these terms of madhahis. The reason why is because the name originates to a person, a being, right? Imam Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, Hanbi. So anything, any name which returns back to a being, a human being, who is not Ma'asum, who can make mistakes and get it right. Why do we follow, I would say we're following that person, why we should be following that which makes no mistakes, the Quran and the Sunnah. So then when you look at the terms Ahl Hadith and Salafiya, they don't belong to no person, no organization. They don't belong to nothing. They belong. They are. They are similitudes for the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Sahaba. So, would anybody in this room, anybody have a problem? In would anybody have a problem in this room saying that I follow the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Sahaba? Anybody? Nobody. Would, and the Prophet said. The best generation is my generation, then the generation after it, and the generation after it. So he gave Tazkia, or, or, or a reference, good reference for the first three generations. <coughs> so if I extended that statement out to, is there anybody in this room that would have a problem with, if I said, we follow the Quran upon the Sunnah, the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Sahaba and the first three generations? Anybody? And in that first generation, it includes some of the Madhaibs. But the first three generations. So anybody have a problem with that? No. That, what I just said, is exactly what Ahlul Hadith is, is exactly what Salafiyya is. And I assume that answers your question in the back there as well. I know it does. I, 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 I knew you were going to ask that question. Well, mashallah, the brother asked the question. Because the brother has had double vision since he's coming with his glasses. And I've tried very hard to rectify. Inshallah, what's that surah? Surah Anan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, read this. Read. How do you start up again? Verse one. Verse one. Inna ladina farakudina hum makanu shi'a lasta minhum fi shay. Inna ma'amuhum ila Allah. To the end of the ayah, where it says that verily, those who divided their religion into sects and groups, you or Muhammad have nothing to do with them in the slightest. Indeed, their end, of, their end will be with Allah, and He will inform them of what He is to do. This is for those who say, I'm Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali, I'm, uh, I'm Sufi, I'm Naqshabandi, I'm Shiri, I'm this, I'm that. This is for them. As for one who says, I follow the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the first generation, he's not calling himself to no group. He's not calling himself to no individual, no, Malik, no, no human. He's called it, he's called himself and the people to that which can never be wrong. I have no mistake. And he's not saying he is them. There's some people we know that say, I'm Salafi, I'm Salafi, I'm Salafi, thinking that they're getting some tazkiyah out of this, that they are better than the others. If anybody says that, thinking that they're better than, than the others, then they are mistaken. This is wrong. And this is what gives the Dawa Salafiyah a bad name. And this is why people don't like it. I can understand where you're coming from. When people say, I'm sorry, be sorry, sorry, they probably give it an impression that to the other people that they're better than them. Well, natural fact, you know, no. We may, we claim we're salary, we may be worse than others. We have so many sins on our heads that, you know, we've got some repentance for, and the other people are very pious. And they're both on the same aqidah, except one doesn't call himself salary, the other, yeah, the other one does. Calling yourself salary doesn't make you any better. It's all about following the way. It's all about the way. So you don't have to call yourself Salafi, as long as you're following the way. You don't have to. 
You don't have to say, I'm salif, I'm salif, I'm salif, as long as you're following the way of the salaf of salaf. But if a, a, a situation comes where you need to clarify for the people, this is wrong and this is right. In meaning, this way of that of the Salafiyah is the correct way, and this way of, for example, Sufiya is incorrect. If you need to mention it, then there's no harm in mentioning it. We should not have allergy spots when somebody says that he's Salafi, if there's a necessity. The only problem we have is when people try to push this down other people's throats. Allah well, no, Yes, you. Could, you, could you give a definition of the word Salaf or the Salafi? Okay. The word Salafiya, remember, remember that Salafiya refers to the way of what I mentioned earlier, the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the, sahab, of the Sahaba, the first three generations. That is the meaning of the word Salafiya. Then the Salaf, the Salaf are those people who lived in those first three generations who follow that criteria. So we understand what the word Salafiya means, we understand what the word Salaf means. When someone says, I am Salafi, it means I am one who follows that, the first three generations. Oof. And the word Salaf Salih, have you heard that word? Salaf Salih, this is referring to specifically the first three generations, because the Salaf doesn't, is not limited to just the first three generations, as I mentioned earlier, actually. The Salaf is of predecessors. All the people came in every single generation before the generation we're living in now, are Salaf. So people lived 100 years ago, are Salaf. People lived 700 years ago, Salaf. 1400 years ago, are Salaf also. Salaf just means predecessors. They came, they came before us. Salaf of Salih is the first three generations, specifically the ones about which the Prophet Sallallahu said there's, you know, he said good about the, the, these are the best of generations. So when someone says, I'm Salafi, he says, I'm one who follows the way of the predecessors. He can never say, he can never say, can he, that I am of the Salaf of Salih, can he? That would be, have you ever heard anybody say, I'm following the way of the Salaf of Salih? Of course, you're following the way of the you can't say following the way of the Salaf of Salih, but I am Salaf of Salih, you can't say that. That's specific for who? The first three generations of Allah Alam.